Vsauce, Kevin here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Visited by a record 6.3 million people last year to look at a rotating collection of over 1.5 million pieces, ranging from Mesopotamian cylinder seals to King Henry VIII's personal armor. 20% of the total collection, 306,353 items, were collected by one person, Jefferson Burdick. But why would he do that? Why do people collect things? Autographs, barf bags, cards, dolls, erasers, Fabergé eggs, gum, hair, ink jokers, knives, lunch boxes, miniature chairs, nails, oil perfume bottles, quilts, rocks, soap, toothbrushes, umbrella covers, video games, wine labels, X-Men, yo-yos, zippos. What is a collection? Is it just acquiring stuff? Or is it a carefully selected, curated assembly around a particular theme? Is your memory a collection of thoughts? Is living just collecting memories? Are your thoughts a collection of you? Well, maybe. But psychoanalyst Werner Munsterberger defined a collection as the selecting, gathering, and keeping of objects of subjective value. For Jefferson R. Burdick, it was cards. Born in 1900, Burdick grew up with the dawn of photography and mass-printed illustrations, with half-tone printing technology allowing for the reproduction of complex images. Picture cards were inserted into consumer products like pouches of tobacco to bolster brand awareness. A generation before television beamed moving pictures into the living room, Burdick and his friends were captivated by the brilliantly colored chromo lithographs printed on thin cardboard stock saying practically every small boy saved these kinds of cards. We made our dads use certain brands, whether they liked them or not. The most popular icons to grace product insert cards came from baseball, a game that took the United States by storm in the wake of the Civil War. By the 1900s, America's cities fielded teams to play a game that helped unify a divided country. From Boston to St. Louis, regional competition was channeled through sports. Advertisers leveraged the popularity of the game and its stars to promote their products. In 1889, kids in Boston fought over the old Judge Cigarettes picture card of the Boston Bean Eaters' Mike King Kelly. And in 1909, boys in Pittsburgh watched their fathers open pouches from the American Tobacco Company to see if their favorite pirate, Honus Wagner, would emerge. Wagner, who reportedly didn't want his picture associated with marketing cigarettes to children, pulled his card from production. With fewer than 60 known to exist, one of them sold at auction in 2013 for $2.1 million. But during Burdick's lifetime, all of these cards were basically worthless. In a 1933 Gaudi Babe Ruth that could sell for $250,000 today is not significantly more valuable than an 1891 Allen & Ginter Golden Penciled Hamburg chicken. In 1961, two years before his death, Burdick valued that Holy Grail T206 Wagner card at just 50 bucks. But it wasn't about the money. It was about the collection. He spent a lifetime amassing not only 30,000 baseball cards, but hundreds of thousands of postcards, tobacco and baker cards, ranging from champion women swimmers to perilous occupations and depictions of jokes. In the developing era of cheap mass production, Burdick collected and cataloged virtually every type of card printed. Centuries before, the Marind people of South New Guinea were collecting human heads. They believed skulls, along with other objects, contained a sacred life force known as mana, invisible power capable of soothing insecurity, anxiety, and feelings of vulnerability. Mana is the magic that human belief imbues in objects, whether it's a religious relic embodying the power of a deity, a dream catcher to filter nightmares, or picture cards that could teleport Jefferson Burdick back to his youth. Humans add meaning to objects and search for soulless safety and security in them, which might just come with the territory of being born. Carl Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, believed that collecting stems from a collective unconscious nuts and berries behavior inherited from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Father of psychoanalysis Sigmund Freud believed that collecting originates in an infant's trauma associated with bowel control. Holding on to one's poop then becomes holding on to one's objects. 
Werner Munsterberger, the author of Collecting an Unruly Passion, believed collecting to be a relief from the shock and uncertainty felt when an infant realizes they're a separate entity from their mother. They're alone, and an object helps fill that void. Psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott describes a comfort object as something that substitutes the mother-child bond. Often a physical object, like a teddy bear or security blanket, it's the first possession of the child that's understood to be not the mother and not me. Like thumb-sucking replacing the comfort of breastfeeding, the teddy bear becomes a source of emotional security. Collecting is when this protection becomes a passion. But being a collector requires access to and the availability of objects. Historically, only the elite had access. Bishops like Abbot Suger collected religious relics such as splinters allegedly taken from the Holy Cross. Alchemists during the reign of Rudolf II gathered artifacts from around the world with the hopes that somewhere within the collection lie the Philosopher's Stone, believed to be capable of teaching humanity the alphabet of creation. And Tsar Peter the Great turned an inherited cabinet of curiosities, furniture designed to store magical objects like bezoars and unicorn horns, which were actually narwhal tusks, into a collection spanning 30 rooms that was eventually opened to the public in 1714. The availability of items to collect blossomed during colonization and the expansion of trade. A generation before Burdick, Sir Thomas Phillips set out to collect one copy of every book in the world. But it wasn't until mass production that a set could reasonably be completed. You couldn't exactly collect a complete set of Greek sculptures. Burdick lived in the first era in which an average person could build an extensive collection of goods. And then he lost control of his hands. By age 33, chronic arthritis, likely exacerbated from his job assembling electrical parts, reduced Burdick's mobility. Living alone in Syracuse, New York, he renewed his childhood interest in cards and made it his mission to collect every single one before he died. And he did it the hard way. Burdick's collection was built by trading with collectors he met through magazines and by going to libraries, small store exhibits, and auction sales. Unfortunately for him, eBay, which today has over 800 million items listed and boasts $82 billion worth of items sold in 2015, was 60 years away. With Burdick, as with any true collector, there was no saturation point. Just as eating food provides temporary hunger fulfillment, so does obtaining a new object. Collector Paul Walruff said he would manger avec ses yeux, eat with his eyes. A sentiment Burdick shared when he said, card collecting is primarily an inherited love of pictures. The hunt to obtain a new object sparks a collector's seeking system defined by neuroscientist Dr. Jak Pongsep as a basic impulse in animals, including humans, to search, investigate, and make sense of the environment. It's the same biological need that drives a dog to investigate a noise, or the curiosity that influenced you to watch this video. For a collector, the satisfaction from attaining a new piece quickly subsides, and the hunt resumes. Collecting as a form of preserving the past confirms our belief that there must be an infinite truth. Life existed before me, and it will exist after me. And here's the proof. Collecting as a form of inspiration influenced artists like Rembrandt, who made paintings of his antique sculptures of Homer, Aristotle, and Socrates. Or writer Umberto Eco, who when asked if he had time to read his huge collection of literature and poetry, said it is not indispensable to read a book. It's enough to touch it, and by a mysterious fluid, you absorb it. Whether it's Echo's mysterious fluid or a tribal belief that objects carry mana, it's the reason an X-ray of Elvis Presley can sell for $3,500 and an X-ray of your cousin Larry was probably thrown away. And collecting as a form of establishing one's identity is a celebration of individuality because no two collections are the same. Your button, coin, or card collection creates a conceptual circle of magic that wards off uncertainty and chaos, helps define you, and proves not only that you exist, but that you are unique. A collection is a secure micro world of order entirely controlled by you in a macro world of chaos. But that becomes a problem when the toy trains control the conductor. 
In 2013, Hoarding Disorder was split off into its own entry under Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders in the DSM-5. It's defined as persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of the value others may attribute to them. The American Psychiatric Association estimates that 2-5% of the population suffer from hoarding disorder, which creates fire hazards and health hazards for themselves and family members. Some people are incapable of letting their objects go. But as Burdick's health deteriorated, letting go of his collection became a personal crusade. When Sir Hans Sloan donated his massive collection of coins, books, and dried plants to the Royal Society in 1759, the British Museum was born. Jefferson Burdick was determined to leave his legacy at the Met, and curator A. Hyatt Mayer accepted the offer under the condition that Burdick organize it all. He spent the next 16 years cataloging all 300,000 cards, and eventually moved to New York City to work on the project full-time at a small oak desk here in the Drawings and Prints Department of the Met. Along the way, he developed the American Card Catalog, a classification system for organizing old cards that's still used today. Burdick was determined to immortalize his collection in the face of his progressing illness. It became a race against time. He took cortisone shots that made him sick just to briefly dull pain so bad that it took a full minute of agony just to put on his hat. He'd often tell Mayer, I might not make it, but he did. When the final card was glued down into history, he stood up, painfully twisted into his coat, and said, I shan't be back. The very next day, Jefferson Burdick checked into University Hospital and never checked out. He died two months later. According to Mayer, the cause of his death was an exhausted heart. But he didn't die from collecting. He lived from it. And in his collection lived the dream that a nobody like Jefferson Burdick, a nobody like me, a nobody like you, each in our own unique way, has a chance to leave a lasting positive mark on the world. And as always, thanks for watching. Huge thanks to Guinness World Records for providing great photos of amazing collectors. And tremendous thanks to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and everyone in the Drawings and Prints Department.